All right, what's up, everybody, and welcome to episode number 39 of Uncovering Unexplained Mysteries for Thursday, March 23rd, 2017. We are definitely well into the uh, the year here. I don't think I've it's really... Gone, it's, it's gone by really quick, yeah. for me personally. Almost too fast. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's like I look at the stuff that I've accomplished or I've wanted to accomplish, and yeah, I moved out. That was a really big deal, and I have almost a full sleeve on my left arm, so that's that's cool too. But like, as far as my personal creative endeavors, it's taken a big slump in the last yeah. few months. I mean, not with this podcast. This podcast is the only consistent thing in my life right now, pretty much, <laughs> except for my gigs, I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, I haven't been able to like do like, any videos. Well, I've been behind on all my stuff. I, I, I'm, you know, screw NCA's March Madness. Uh, the real March Madness is the schedule for my channel. So I, I had I got a little bit under the weather, which screwed up my schedule anyway. So... I mean, it's partly my fault for accepting way too big of a plate, so to speak. I mean, I was like, I was like, okay, X Men movies, all of them, all, all the King Kong films, Power Rangers, <laughs> and and some anime, all in one month. I'm insane. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, at least you're getting it out there. I mean, I'm shit. Last video I did was a video of my new house, a tour of my new house that I knocked out in like probably. 30 45 minutes from editing and everything but i mean that's literally the only thing i've been able to put out i've just been so freaking busy i haven't had time yeah. to do anything um a lot of that has to do with the moving in process just random shit that pops up i mean again i, I don't understand how i'm a single guy uh, with barely any responsibilities who just doesn't have that much time i don't have kids i don't have a wife i don't have any i mean i have gigs i have a lot of gigs that that I think that takes up my main gigs, a.k.a. a job, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, this is Uncovering and Explained Mysteries, uh, the podcast, and uh, we are here to talk about segments from Unsolved Mysteries, mostly. Um, so, some kind of news in the Unsolved Mysteries front. Uh, John and Terry Cosgrove, or <laughs> they're not married, John Cosgrove and Terry Moyer are <laughs> going to be doing uh, what's called, known as a Ask Me Anything on Reddit. Now, Reddit's uh, known as the front page of the internet. I still don't really know exactly what the fuck Reddit is, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't either. I don't go on Reddit that much. In fact, I don't really ever go on Reddit, uh, except if I'm just randomly looking around and a Reddit post happens to pop up. Actually... I go on Reddit to find links <laughs> to watch some sports. So that's pretty much the only time I use Reddit. <laughs> yeah, they have a Reddit like it's basically a big message board essentially is <laughs> what it is. Um and you'll but for some reason it got it's gotten really big uh over the past like 10 years and I can see why because it's just there's a lot of interaction with it and uh people can you remain rem they can remain somewhat private on there and there's been a lot of leaks and stuff that have followed up on that have ended up on reddit like for instance uh the plot synopsis for the ghostbusters reboot essentially leaked on reddit from some guy who said he was he, he was a a guy who worked on the film and oh, he wow. saw a cut of the film and he leaked the synopsis and he was dead on oh wow yeah, so celebrities a lot of times will get involved on Reddit and they'll do this ask me anything and it's basically a chance for the fans or for any Joe fuckface to get on there and ask them anything and, and they answer and they've had a lot of people do it and now I guess John Cosgrove and Terry Moyer are doing it. Um, now it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be happening. Uh, Mike's dying of uh, some lung uh, coal, coal miner's lung over there apparently. Um, black lung. <laughs> no. I, I just had an itch in my throat, so I'm, I'm getting over these allergies a little bit. I took a 24-hour allergy pill last night. Yeah, if, if it's if it's any more just strikingly obvious that we don't have a professional studio that we record this in would be like now or many other times in the podcast. There's obviously not a cough button here. Um, but anyway, April That's 3rd. That's the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> April 3rd at 3, uh, 3 p.m. my time, Eastern Standard Time. Um they're doing an Ask Me Anything, and I'm going to be up in that bitch. I have it marked on my calendar. I'm going to be up in that bitch. I'm going to get some answers from those, too. He's going to smack that bitch up. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, okay, this is what pisses me off. So, Mike, you did that bonus segment um, yeah. on the Patreon yesterday, and, uh-huh. and kind of like basically what was that? That bonus segment was my reactions to this uh, article, uh, if I could say the word article without uh, completely just having a stroke there for a second, uh, article online from this uh, true crime website. And this guy, he interviewed, it's, not, not, it's less of an article and more of an interview. So he interviewed John Cosgrove. And uh, so, and honestly, it was a bit disappointing, to be perfectly honest. A lot of the questions he asked were kind of like, really? Like, how did the show get started? Everyone already knows that already. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there were, there were a few questions and answers that did aggravate me. Uh the first one was this, where he asked uh, John, he said, uh, let's begin with the big news for Unsolved Mysteries fans that came down this past December when it was announced the Film Rise Company had acquired distribution rights to the show. This meant that Unsolved Mysteries was now eligible to be presented online on online streaming services. Can you discuss this deal and, decision, and the decision to move forward with it? This is uh, John's answer. Well, we had always wanted the most exposure we could get for the unsolved show. Uh. Yeah, let me interject right there. That uh, we did. Me and Mike always talk a little bit before we actually record the podcast, and Mike actually just told me that detail, like somewhat in passing. And I'm just like, what? We we <laughs> always want to get the most exposure for the show. Bull fucking shit, you do, you fucking liar. Bullshit. <laughs> We started a whole podcast worshipping your fucking show, and you strike my ass down with a cease and desist when all I wanted to do was interview you and Terry and get you on the podcast and ask you about this shit, and you, and you threaten me with legal action. Then when I try to call you man to man, you send your fucking lawyers in the way between, you know, you hide behind your lawyer, like you cower behind your lawyer. And there's more I'd like to call you personally, but I don't want to do that because that would be slander but yeah that's bull crap man that is such bull crap so not true so to tie and into the ama thing i'm i'm gonna be on that bitch april 3rd and i'm gonna be you know i'm not gonna well i don't know maybe i will say who i am i'm sure he knows of me at this point i'm gonna ask those people and be like dude what is your guys problem with being so protective over you know, people, you know, u- utilizing, like, clips from the show. For instance, my YouTube video where I compared the revamp to the new show or whatever. I- I've had to defend that video numerous times with people trying to make claims on it and stuff like that. And it's just, like, it's very, like, they don't understand the concept of fair use. You know, they're striking people down with cease and desist letters, who are simply trying to make a fan podcast. You know the show Game of Thrones? You know how many fucking fan podcasts there are of Game of Thrones and Star Wars? Is, is, is Lucas uh, Lucas Films striking all of them down? I don't think so. They still all seem to be up and running. But one podcast, fan podcast, about the show Unsolved Mysteries, and we get a cease and desist, that's why this show is now called Uncovering Unexplained Mysteries instead of Uncovering Unsolved Mysteries, which is what it used to be called, which is not digging into their profit margins in any way, shape, or form. If anything, people have subscribed to Amazon Prime as a result of our podcast so they can watch the fucking episodes! So all that stuff about wanting the free publicity or, or, or exposure is a fucking lie, John. It's a lie, and you know it's a lie. Why are you lying? You know, I get the whole PR spin. You want to look good, you know, in front of everybody and not show your, your fucking hidden fangs and your talons that you have underneath your fucking Darth Maul coat of your, your Emperor Palpatine robe. You secretly have claws and talons and all this shit. Yeah, so that pissed me off here and that. Because you guys, some of you might understand that I went through like a month of uh, just anxiety levels through the roof when I, when this podcast first began. Because we, thre- we the, they threatened legal action against the podcast, against me specifically. Um, because I was the one who reached out to Don Devereaux and sent him a letter, had my address on it so they had a way of getting a hold of me better than they do a lot of people i guess 
Um, so yeah, I went through like a month of having to rebrand the show. If you go back and listen to the old episodes, you'll hear me doing a voiceover over each individual episode. You know why? Because I used a cover of the original show's theme. That's how we would open the show. And I had to go through and get and cut that out and put, dude, just long story short, he caused me a lot of grief. So that's why I get so passionate about it. And he, especially hearing him say shit like, Oh, we we take all the free publicity we can. Yeah. It's it's just it's fucking mind blowing. Yeah, it is, and and, and so was uh, he. Actually, I uh, was talking about the DVD sets, and uh, this the, the the guy who did this uh, interview. He asked him a question about you know oh about the DVD sets. Are there any more considerations that you might give to releasing the Unsolved Mystery seasons on DVD? And this is John's answer. He says, "No, we haven't entertained that idea." We cherry picked the best stories to put in the DVD collection, and the sales were okay, but not great. So we so- sort of shelved the plan to do the entire seasons. So this means, and, I, and if you've heard the bonus segment, y- you've heard my thoughts on it already. But I, I think Josh should definitely, you know, get his thought, you know, get his take on. I, I think people should. I think people would want to hear his take on this. I can't speak because this is so frustrating to me. This is, I can't even fathom the the idea that he'd be like. Yeah, let's do a best of that isn't really a best of. Yeah, the fertility statues. That's one of your best segments. Well, um, you know, it's funny. He says, well, and we're not going to do seasons. You know, uh, you should have done seasons from the beginning, and then your sales would have been better. Or your sales might have been even just a wee bit better if you allowed fan communities like ours to grow and to prosper and not shut them the fuck down. <laughs> And I mean, it's not just me. It's not just us, you know? I mean, the guy we know, there, there's a guy on YouTube named John Howe or whatever. And, and he would just do these little videos where he would talk about the segments on YouTube. And he used the thumbnail. He used the Unsolved Mysteries logo thumbnail. And he got he got an email from John and Terry or, or from their representative because there's someone mm-hmm. who runs their Facebook page. And I think their representative told him to change his stuff. I mean, it. look, man. I'm telling you, they don't understand how the internet works. They wouldn't be doing this kind of silly shit if they knew how the internet works nowadays. Because this is this is what people do to get it, to drum up interest now. Nostalgia critic on YouTube, he talks about movies. A lot of times he's taking the piss out of them. But you know what? Even the ones that he takes the piss out of, there's still probably a shit ton of people going out and watching that movie as a result of the nostalgia critic talking about it. And a lot of movie studios, I think, get that. So that's why they're not like, you know, I'm not saying it happens all the time because you've had issues with that. Well, as I mean, well. what I get usually is just uh, people are just looking at the thumbnail or they, they're the way that they're asked to do their job is so ass backwards. They're like, oh, we just look at the title and, you know, then we, we don't have time to watch the video. We don't have time to, you know, go through ads or whatever. I'm like, my video has no copyrighted material in it. It would be in ads. You don't have time to watch ads? Five seconds. Skip the ad. Don't give me that shit. That's bullshit. That's a fucking bullshit excuse. I'm sorry. But uh, I've, been, I've been lucky, I have to admit, because all of these situations recently have been resolved fairly quickly. But regardless, it still doesn't make it any less of a just ridiculous thing to have to deal with. Yeah, the uh, sitcom, online sitcoms.com or whatever the fuck it's called. It's like a message board, uh, which by the way. Sitcoms online, yeah. There you go. Which uh, I've been trying to promote the show. I actually invested in a Facebook campaign and we've gotten actually a lot lot more page likes because of that. Um, so I, I was like thinking of other ways I could spread the word about our podcast. So I went on that online. Twitter? <laughs> eh, maybe. I fucking hate Twitter. And you know what? I hate message boards too. Cause I went on online sitcoms.com and I'm like, man, what a fucking archaic form of like communication. It's a, it's, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool place. I think, I mean, that's where I get the information. From I just don't nice like the, there. I don't like the, Who the, the actually um, went through the time and effort to go through and, Make an episode guide for the Amazon Prime episodes, and let us know which ones are missing uh, from these. Per- well, these my my main segments. complaint is just the message board medium itself. To me, is very archaic. It's yeah. like the little box where you type in your thing, and then someone replies. I don't know. It's just kind of 
just kind of outdated to me. It's It's been around since the beginning of the internet message boards. But I posted our podcast on there under the AMA thing, and I was talking about how, you know, the whole John and Terry thing and the cease and desist and Don Devereaux and all that. And someone posted, like, uh, the jabroni has been outed. You're either lying or uh, attention seeking, or you're retarded, or something like that. And I was like, huh. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that one. I saw the one where they said, "What are you typing?" Like an 11 year old girl. Yeah, I saw that one too. Yeah, and I'm just but, like, uh, uncalled for much. Uh, don't, exactly. I don't mean, see every, how... every every message board has had you know jerks like that. But you did get a a, a few replies actually that were pretty nice. I yeah. saw. So. So yeah, anyway, What's that's that? going on. Sorry, the the about that there's whole... our drama for for the intro, yeah. but it actually was unsolved mysteries related. So yes, there you go. <laughs> you know how hard it is to keep everything unsolved mysteries themed uh, a lot of times, but I'll throw an, even another thing at you. Um, this was uh, alerted to me by uh, one of our dedicated listeners, Morgan, out in Canada. I don't think I can go one episode without referencing her in some way, shape, or form. I don't know why that is. Um, I'm not secretly in love with you, Morgan, I swear, but somehow you always get brought up in Canada or something. I don't know. Uh, but she alerted me to this Instagram account and anybody who has Instagram, you guys got to go out and follow this page right away. It's called unsolved mysteries people. And we liter- talked about this. <laughs> huh? We talked about before I started recording. No, you actually mentioned it. I thought no you were recording. No, All right. I have not. <laughs> Um, but anyway, this Instagram page, literally all they do is they take screenshots of the people who have been on Unsolved Mysteries, um, with their name and like what they were or whatever. And they'll put just these hashtags and sometimes they're funny as hell. And you got in like the comments, people just say like outlandish stuff like, um, they got just one of the, the, the doorman, it'll say Raymond Sullivan and he's the doorman. And then uh, they'll just (laughs) have, like, someone put hashtag jolly. Someone put hashtag not a pilot because he looks like he's dressed like a pilot. And he's making this, like, (laughs) dirt face. I'm guessing this page is, like, ironic. Like, they're kind of playing off the ironic. Go look how how old and silly this show is and how these people look so, you know, crazy in 90s and stuff. But it's still funny, though. You should really go out and check that out. It's called Unsolved Mysteries People, all one word. Uh, You should go check that page out on Instagram. Uh, Another social media thing that I barely ever use uh, being Instagram. But, hey. I don't even use Instagram. I've heard of it. Well, you don't even have a phone that can do it, do you? No. Well, there you go, guys. It's another reason you should kick in some shekels into our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash uncovering unexplained mysteries for more commentary on that article that uh, we just talked about that Mike did last night. Um, and we were also uh, talking about our YouTube channels earlier. And you can find that. At Mike's YouTube channel is youtube.com slash OCP communications. And mine is youtube.com slash dancing with ghosts. You can check out the videos that we do on there. Not necessarily Unsolved Mysteries related, but entertaining nonetheless. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're going to get into the first segment here that Mike picked. And I think this is what from season. Yeah, this is from season three. So it is on Amazon Prime. It's actually, I believe, on episode two of season three. So um, there you, go. you can definitely check it out. See it for yourself. Um, so, actually, no, it's seven, I believe. It's the same episode as The Gold Lady. Oh, okay. I, I believe that's the case. I, I could be completely off, but I know it was season three. You better be dead right on this mic or it's going to cost <laughs> you your life. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, um, this is about David Stone and uh, the disappearance of this uh, 29-year-old successful stock market analyst. Now, he was deep into the New Age movement as he sought spiritual guidance. Um, He sought spiritual guidance because apparently when he became a football player, uh, his his dad was quoted here and he said like, oh, he became like a commando. And it was like he completely changed it completely changed his demeanor and his attitude. And I'm kind of like, I don't know if it's just football that did that. (laughs) But okay. Well, you got to go through a lot of shit when be when training to be uh, at the. Yeah, level. I know, but I I don't know if football automatically unlocks the asshole gene. 
I don't know. Honestly, when when my cousin started doing it, he went from kind of this impish kind of uh, uh-huh. you know kind of person to uh, he kind of did become an asshole. Um, I mean, the stuff they make you do, getting up at five in the morning to go train, and then you got to do it later on that day, and the stuff. Well, I, I yeah, kind of like I boot mean, camp in a way. Yeah. But also, it depends on what kind of person you are. Like, some people, you know, they'll just take it, and they're still the same person. Other people, it's like, if you are you just start acting like an asshole because of football, maybe that was already there. Yeah, pro- well, yeah, fair enough. I mean, the, football might have been the catalyst to unlock, you know, what was already in there. You but anyway, know. what I remember fondly about this segment, it, I thought it was kind of funny, actually, is how he supposedly got into this new age movement and how he started to go this direction is because he was at a party and i guess there was this guy this reenactment i honestly thought was kind of funny because the way it was shot and just how extremely melodramatic everything was and there was this he was at a party it was his party and there was like some guy there who i don't know exactly what this guy was doing wrong because it's not really explained and so what happens is David flips the fuck out and starts throwing this guy against the wall and then starts beating on him. And of course, everyone's like, no, stop it. You know, in the reenactment, you know, they can actually have good fight choreography or whatever. So it was clearly the punches aren't landing type <laughs> deal. <laughs> some um, some folly artists like beating the shit out of a head of lettuce with a bat for the punching sound effects. Um, and what really cracked me up was, uh, I think it was the father who was, or a friend of his, it was a friend of David's who was saying, yeah, David told me, you know, that's what happened. And he said he hit him 20 to 25 times, but he didn't hurt him. Shadouken! I'm like, you hit him 20 to 25 times and this is some jacked up football player and you didn't hurt him? Really? <laughs> yeah, that's like, um... 25 punches, I mean, a grandma could punch me 25 times, and if it was in the same spot, it'd start to get a little sore, at least. I don't buy the it didn't hurt him thing. But that that's the that's a vernacular that a lot of people use. Oh, I just hit him a few times, so I didn't hurt him. Like, what about the, the black eye you gave the guy? What about the bruises and stuff? But I didn't really hurt him. Yeah, their definition of hurt is kill. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't kill, well, like, hurt, I mean kill, I mean hurt, you know. Well, I didn't break his arm or anything, so I didn't hurt him. Um, so because of that, he had a spiritual awakening of sorts. He was like, man, that was an asshole move on my part. So we decided to go out and try to have a vision quest in the desert somewhere. So according to Deputy, Deputy Sheriff Bill Cavalier... The investigating officer on Halloween of 1988, yeah, Halloween, All Hallows Eve, mm-hmm. Stone walked into the desert, and he was seen several times that day claiming that he was looking for the beast before vanishing in the desert. The actor here isn't really the best, so they have the reenactment, and he's all like, what are you, they, they, they're, they have the people who are driving up and checking it up on this guy, and... <laughs> And they're all like, what are you doing? It's like, I'm looking for the beast. Now, now I think I remember that one. Uh, was that filed under an, an amnesia one? No, that's a different one. Oh. This is missing persons. Oh, okay. So there is another one where this guy goes around and gets lost in the desert, loses his memory so, and stuff but, like that. But did it mention, because obviously, folks, I didn't have time to watch this segment. I've been a busy man, so I'm going to be interviewing Mike a, a little bit about this segment. <laughs> so did he, was he actually like, take, did he take drugs? Was that ever like specified of something that happened? No. Oh, okay. No. I, I, I think it sounds like he might have taken something before. I mean, it's like the Vision Quest thing reminds me of this, this segment, the sequence in uh, Young Guns where they take the peyote, and I, I always remember this quote because it always cracks me up when I think about it. It's like, we're in the spirit world, asshole! They can't see us! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen that movie, but that sure does sound funny. Uh, so, anyway, that's that one of the few westerns that I do like because I'm not really a big fan of westerns. But he's going around and he's looking for the beast, which also reminds me of Poltergeist because of the whole. that's the whole name of the evil spirit that 
captured Carol Ann. It's the Beast. And so he's vanished completely off the face of the earth. Uh, his car was found abandoned along Highway 80 five days later. And David actually left several mysterious clues after he had vanished relating to the New Age movement. Uh, first, David had left his car near pyramid-shaped mountains. And pyramids were important symbols in the movement. As the search began for David, his trail headed northwest from his car... And searchers then found a pyramid of rocks surrounded by a triangle of other rocks. Uh, on the next day of searching, another pyramid was found. And next to it was David's gold Rolex watch and two quarters. Three miles to the north, searchers found a Fibonacci sequence used by stock market and analysts, which is a sequence of numbers, written in the sand. However, instead of 21, which ends the sequence, 18 did. Uh, some believe that David may have been signaling for help by putting the 18 there because the 18 was his uh, football jersey number, his number for uh, his jersey uh, in high school. And it was also, uh, I believe it was also another number that he was associated with. That's a cryptic and ass way to ask for help. It is, though. I, I doubt. I think they're just r grasping for straws there. I'm going to do this elaborate thing that not a lot of people even know about. And, and in this sequence, this is how I'm going to ask for help. You've got to really want it if you're going to help me. You can't just simply help me. <laughs> You've got to work for that shit. you got to decode some sequences to lend me a hand. Because that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense at all. So I really think they were just reaching there. Uh, some believe that David may have been signaling, signaling for help. Yeah, I, I doubt it. Uh, Bloodhounds tracked his scent to Highway 80, 13 miles north of where his car was found. The Stones found a strange business card in David's car, uh, his uh, his parents, along with an even stranger note. And the the, the business card was for this guy and uh, who had a company in Arizona. And they interviewed him. He was like, I don't know how they got that card. Um, I guess I must have left it behind at the campsite or something around that same area. I don't know him. I, I didn't give it to him. I don't know. No, I, I, I can't help but to go back to that whole Fibonacci thing and how it's talking about uh, commonly used in stock markets. Like how they're trying to kind of relate that. Uh, even in his crazy uh, kind of dream quest or vision quest or whatever, he's still like using the stock market world in there every now and then. Like, it, like that'd be funny if it's like we also found a rock formation in the shape of a fax machine in a water cooler, also commonly <laughs> found in stock market business offices. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been classic. Um, but yeah, then uh, they also found a stranger note that was inside of a little pocket Bible that David had. Um, they think the word is in the safe. Six knives in Rob's room. Use buys your tea and use take your chances. Halloween. Jeez, this is, this, this is a shaping up to be like a really good movie so far. Yeah, I mean, but, but at the this, same this time, like it really like, happened. The, the quote was like, "Huh? <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> I don't even know what what is what does he even mean by that?" Um, and his parents tried to decode it, and they were all like, "Well, you know, like, you buys your tea, takes your chances. Maybe it's thinking like, uh, uh, you take your time." Or actually, it was a there's something else that he said, but it was like it was like a regular sort of. Uh, a uh, normal term a lot of people use. Um, and Halloween just happened to be the day that David vanished. So to this day, nobody knows what happened to David or why he acted so strangely before he disappeared. But actually, there is a uh, update, a pretty sad one, though, uh, because sadly, the case, it was unresolved. In February of 1992, David Stone's remains were found in the desert by two hikers. And although police have been unable to determine how or why he died, there was no evidence of foul play in his death. Huh. Now that's bizarre because I'm thinking to myself, if somebody disappears in that manner with all that cryptic shit, 
that would tell me because if someone's looking for help if somebody's trying to reach out or whatever they're, they're not going to do it in these weird stupid cryptic ways that that my thought would be somebody kidnapped him and then that kidnapper is like some charles manson-esque kind of crazy person and they leave all this cryptic clues behind for you to figure it out and decode the killer's uh you know code to get the person that you're trying to rescue that, so are you are you making uh, a theory that the zodiac kidnapped this right guy. it would be something like that it would be like a, someone a zodiac-esque you know killer or wannabe mm -hmm. or whatever would, would maybe capture this guy and and that's the guy who killed him now to me that would be a more logical conclusion maybe he went out to this desert or whatever on his own recognizance but went once out there ran into some a shady character or whatever this, this is what i think happened i think it's similar to the case uh, of the truck driver uh, Devin Williams schizophrenia. I, I, I think he had a mental breakdown. Uh, he was going out in the desert. He was already stressed out, and so he was at. He went in in search of uh, awakening, and I think in search of awake in this moment of searching for awakening, I think he was already going through a mental breakdown, and then all of this random stuff that he did, it, it, it's just random acts of craziness. Like think about Devin Williams. He was like smacking. What remember the image? Uh, uh, he was striking smacking, a twenty dollar bill. With striking a rock, twenty dollar yeah. bill with a rock. Um, so that's really what I believe happened. He had a mental breakdown in the in the desert, and uh, he got lost, and then he just was never found, and he died of uh, dehydration or you know things that happen uh, in the desert uh, of exposure. Now, see, tr to me, that like he's he's like the true like hippie. There's so many like armchair Facebook hippies on my yeah. Facebook wall. I know you're <laughs> like, why don't you go out to the desert? Yeah, it's like it's a, like a, you, a, dude, a, it's like the, a these, vision quest. these people who post this stupid like you know like a astrology zodiac like other hippie kind of stuff on my Facebook wall, and I'm like, you haven't actually been out to a desert and made some kind of Fibonacci sequence and arranged stones in a pattern and gotten lost and eventually died. You are not hardcore. <laughs> you are. Or an armchair wannabe hippie who posts your little meta kind of shit on Facebook and then you go out to Starbucks and get your coffee and live your normal life like everyone else. You just want to seem interesting and different from everybody so you do that shit. But you're not the real post, deal like this you guy. You should post that quote uh, they think the word is in the safe six knives in Rob's room you buys your tea and you takes your chances. Yeah, see I see, sh I see shit like that all the time on my wall from certain people that I'm friends with but, but not... Out Not in some like Bible in some yeah. desert, you know, <laughs> like that's that's the real deal there. Like that's when you're really getting it. Okay, this person really is different, you know. Not some wannabe. Um. And this was a well shot uh, segment as well. Um, I thought it was funny though. I wanted to note note this that they used the treasure music, you know, the music they use for a lot of the treasure segments. Is that that was kind of with the guitar? A choice. Is there a guitar? Yeah. The, the one that kind of sounded... No, actually, it was the one that was kind of like the Native American sounding oh, one. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seemed like, well, usually that's used for something that isn't as depressing and bleak as this is. <laughs> but th I thought that was an interesting choice. And then they also used, like, trippy music. Like, music that you, you would imagine hearing during an acid trip for some of the sequences as well. Which I thought was an inspired choice. That's pretty cool. I mean, it sucks that he died. You know, I mean, I think yeah. I think that I think the you know being I thought it was a very intriguing though and bizarre disappearance. It always stood out to me when I first saw this segment on the VHS rest. I was like, wow, that that was really weird. I mean, being a stock market analyst, I mean, I, you know, like anything involving the stock market is is that like a whole other level of stress. I can imagine because you're dealing with lots yeah. of money. And money really controls a lot of decisions and a lot of things in your life. So it's kind of like, you know, and him being 29, you know, that's kind of, you know, you're still definitely in that window of time where schizophrenia can, can occur, you know, although it is more common for younger people, like in their late teens to early yeah, 20s to get it. But, but. Uh, maybe it's not necessarily, well... I know for sure that something happened with with my stepfather, and he was older. So this can, de you know, it can definitely happen later in your life, depending on what you're exposed to. And I, I think maybe this religion that he got into tapped into some part of his brain and it unlocked something, 
and it, it drove him off the rails and he wasn't able to get back and and you know it, it really wasn't a good thing that he w- went to the desert in this state if you ask me yeah one of these days and who knows he might have taken some potion or something beforehand too that might have been it too some potion <laughs> some that- kind of you know peyote mixed with mushrooms or something like some of this the stuff that uh uh, William Hurt took an altered state, and then he was in this altered state for days and couldn't get out of it, and was stuck in the desert. And when you said some potion, I'm thinking, what's he in the Legend of Zelda now? He took a heal potion and <laughs> got like his hearts back or whatever. A little video game reference there for you, you know? I, I doubt if that would be a heal potion. If a heal potion does this to you, that's he took a, con- a he took a potion. confusion potion. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that? Like some some troll potion in the game. Yeah. Po- po- uh, he he met up with a Pokemon in the desert, and they used confusion on him, so he wasn't <laughs> able to break out of that status. Um, yeah, me just yeah. dropping dropping video game references. Man, we've we've lost a few listeners just then. Uh, man, you're talking about movies. They're talking about fucking video games. Stick to the damn show. Now I don't know why I'm from New York or whatever, but I am. Uh, <laughs> Give me a slice. Hey, Gino. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's this, the mysterious disappearance and death of David Stone. Um, I don't have anything else to add about this case, so I guess we can head right into the next one. All right, so on the, the wheel of whichever one we should cover, it's between the nudist and David Freeman. Let's spin the wheel here. What do we got? All right, I'm going to put the nudist. The nudist is going to be this... At the top, I got two batteries here. The the battery on the top is going to be the nudist Dave Freeman, and the bombs is going to be at the battery at the bomb. Now I'm going to spin a pen on my desk and see where it lands. All right, Dave Freeman, it is. <laughs> that's one way of choosing the segments. I don't know. Well, that's the one I would have picked anyway. So wow. I thought we'd save the the nudist for last. Um, but yeah, this one is fucked up. Yes, this is very fucked up, and um. I'm not sure, but I'm just going to say it just to cover my bases so I don't get called an asshole again. I believe our moderator off our Facebook group, Thomas Hatfield, chose this one. It's a lovely group, by the way. Lots of interaction on that page. If you want to check it out, it's um, you search on the groups on Facebook. Just search Uncovering Unexplained Mysteries. You know what a group is at this point. Everybody has Facebook. It's, you can go in there and you chat and your comments aren't thrown off to the side of the page like it is on our fan page which you should like that page as well it's facebook.com slash uncovering unexplained mysteries this is the um case of david freeman although david freeman was not the um murdered he was the murderer um the case was really about tim good yeah tim good was who it was really about so uh, i thought this was a great case uh when it was brought up i thought yes um here here i would like yeah, to i had about- never heard of this case before until uh it was mentioned to me that we're going to cover this for this podcast and i i was just watching this segment with my jaw dropped wide open in certain scenes yeah it was like it, yeah, it, it gets really, it gets really uh, fucked up at some points. Wh- wh- what? How does this even happen? All right, so November fourteenth, nineteen ninety four, Folsom, West Virginia. Acting on an anonymous tip, police arrive at the house of a well-to-do farmer named Tim Good. But the tip had come from an unlikely source. A would-be thief had broken in and found more than what he bargained for. The caller said, "Look in the basement." Police came across what appeared to be sparse living quarters. On the bed, a grisly discovery, the the decomposed body of Tim Good. Good had been strangled to death, and his decomposing body remained in that basement for one year. Now, before we go any further, I find that unbelievable that that's how he was discovered. A burglar broke into the house, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to steal me some good shit here, and what the fuck? Fuck, all right, I think uh, whatever bad shit I was going to do, I've been, the Annie has been upped quite a few chips here, so <laughs> I'm going to leave, going to call 911, um, and yeah, have a nice day, everyone. I can imagine him calling 911. Yeah, I just broke into this place, uh, and, and uh, this, this shit is real fucked up, man. Uh, just come over, check the basement. 
Yeah, there's some shit so going there's, on in that so basement. The, uh, so the police come in, arrest him for breaking and entering. <laughs> no, <laughs> Put him he, in, the, in the car, and then go in and check out the dead body in the basement. No, they didn't arrest him. It was a, he he left the house and then he called anonymously. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. That's what that's what I was thinking. That would have been. <laughs> he called from the home. No. No, no, he he like they never got him. Like he just called in, left the the okay. tip or whatever. I, I thought they got him though. No. That that would have been pretty funny. So according to Trooper J B Armstrong, who is the only uh, official who is um is interviewed in this segment as far as like you know police or as as far as that Good old goes. J B. Yeah, he says. Where the body was located, it was basically a dungeon or cell. Bare walls, concrete floor. Upstairs, it was lavishly furnished. A hot tub, jacuzzi, three large screen TVs, a wet bar. It was a very nice upstairs. It was a dungeon in the basement. What is a wet bar? A uh, wet bar is a uh, bar, like where you have alcohol, like liquor okay. and all I, that. I, I mean, just I've never really heard the term wet bar used that much. Yeah, wet kind of usually means like alcohol. Like, for instance, if I'm doing a wedding and it's a dry wedding, that means there's no alcohol. Oh, but, okay. But, you know, All we, right. we don't call it. I mean, it. I was just imagining a bar that's kind of, you know, wet. Oh, yeah. No. You know, the, the kind of like the waterbed or something. But, <laughs> be you know, of... some way that it could keep the, the alcohol cold or something as in yeah, water. Man, that'd, be, <laughs> that'd be far out. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. and then the three TVs. It's like three big screen TVs. Yeah, I'm, one, I'm wondering. I'm wondering what those three. TVs. You know, those TVs were like jai fucking normous because we're talking about the 90s here or late yeah. 80s, early 90s or whatever. You know, those TVs were like the size of two refrigerators. And 90s. Yeah, it was, it was aired in the, in the 1996 episode. Okay, on October 18th. So it was in season eight. So yeah, definitely nineties. Yeah, the big screen TVs back then. It was funny because they were still in the four three aspect ratio. So they, they were, they were the, fucking beasts. Yeah, they were just big squares like Klondike oh, bars. Oh god, and they were extremely heavy. Oh yeah, it was that was a two person job to move like a a big TV back then. And the picture remember, sucked. Like the picture yeah. wasn't even good. It was always dark. I remember. I remember my step my stepdad tried to lift our old uh, TV. Uh, into like the back of the pickup or something to take it to the dump, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it on by himself. Yeah, he, he almost gave himself a hernia to try. The investigators quickly revealed that someone had been living in the house the whole time. Tim's body decomposed in the basement. There was tape on the air ducts, undoubtedly to keep out the odor of the body in the basement. Police also found extensive diaries written by a man by the name of David Freeman. It was Freeman's cryptic writings that helped police piece together the tragic demise of Tim Good. Tim Good operated a 350-acre dairy farm in Collinsville, Pennsylvania. One of his workers was a young man named Gene Kennedy. Kennedy had come from a broken home, and Tim was his unofficial guardian. When I first came to live with Tim... Instead of him just giving it to me, I was like, it was like I was learning something. You know, 13 years old, 50 bucks a week, and being on your own in a place to live, that was pretty neat for me. That's quoting Kennedy there. The author of the diaries, Dave Freeman, was hired on by Tim Good in 1987. At the time, he went by the name Ben. Within months, Freeman and his wife Eliza had moved into the main house with Tim and Gene. Before you knew it, it's he was there. That's just how it is. Tim never even hinted that he even liked Ben. I think in the bit beginning he didn't, quoting Gene Kennedy again. Freeman was something of a self-styled preacher. Tim was estranged from his family and turned to Ben for spiritual guidance. Now this is Tim's neighbor here quoted as saying, He would have an unusual twist in the way he spoke to Tim, implying that he knew more than most did, and therefore Tim looked at him like he was a wise man. And then Gene again comes in saying, I think it started off with Tim finding someone that he thought he could trust. He was very well educated. He would more or less stick with Tim instead of everyone else turning away from him. And I think that's what Tim wanted and needed, end quote. But Freeman seemed to have his own agenda. Gene Kennedy claimed that Freeman started acting as if he owned the farm. And then they depict this whole reenactment scene to where... Um, Gene is actually trying to enter the house, and then Ben, this big, like, six-foot-three black guy, he's just standing in the way, and he wouldn't let Gene in because his wife was sleeping. And Gene's like, 
hey man, come on, fuck off, I'm gonna go in anyway. Well, he didn't say fuck off, but that would be Josh. Can you imagine hearing that <laughs> on Unsolved Mysteries? <laughs> hey man, fuck off, I'm gonna go in anyway. That's just Josh's uh, shorthand writing there. And, you know, when Gene tries to enter the house, Ben just grabs him and throws him up against the wall. At which point, Tim conveniently comes into the scene and he's like, hey, come on, come on, break it up, break it up. And then Ben's like, I'm sorry, but my wife's asleep. And Tim's like, "That you know, Gene lives here too. You know, it doesn't matter. I understand that, but Gene lives here too. And then Gene comes in quoted as saying, when, when he showed up, it wasn't a year after that that Tim stopped da dairy farming when this Ben guy came into the picture. You'd come down to the farm. There was no cows. There were no calves. There was no dry stock. Everything was empty. And then the neighbors quoted again as saying, Tim came up to me one day and he said, you're going to hate me, but I sold the farm. I got $1 million, maybe a little more. And he'd laugh about it. He thought it was funny and he was real proud of himself. Tim turned around and bought a much smaller farm in West Virginia. Gene stayed in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Castlevania. Gene stayed in Pennsylvania, but Freeman and his family made the move with Tim. Oddly, Freeman was now calling himself Dave. And uh, it shows Dave Freeman, a.k.a. Ben, who's just sitting on his ass on the front porch. And Tim's out there cutting wood and stuff. And this is in the reenactment. And Dave Freeman's like, hey, when you're done there, well, why don't you clear out some more of that land out there by the trace? And you know what? When you're done with that, why don't you cut up some more of that wood and we can use it for kindling? And Tim Good's just like, well, how much do you think we need? You know, just being very passive at this moment. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of ironic to me that his last name is Good. Because he seems like a good guy. I mean, but at the same time, because he's a good guy, he's he was so easily manipulated here. Yeah. And then Ben, respond, or Dave Freeman, as he's being called now, responds back, The Lord says, the man who doesn't work doesn't eat, while his fat ass just sits on the porch watching Tim do all the work. I thought that was pretty fucking ironic. He's, he actually yeah. wasn't even fat, but I just, I don't know, with that, him just sitting well, there. Well, I mean, I mean, the whole thing. I mean, it, it, it just baffles me how somebody like this, just how anybody could let this go as far as it did. It's just, I, I I can't even wrap my head around it. Yes, it's manipulation at its finest, which we'll see later on. It gets even worse. So, uh, George Anderson, Tim's neighbor, and I, I'm sorry, I just, uh, I just gotta take a moment here. George Anderson, that was the name of uh, Beavis and Butthead's uh, uh, neighbor, and he actually talked just like Hank Hill. Them boys are whacking off in my trailer. Anyway, uh, George, <laughs> An George Anderson, uh, Tim's neighbor, uh, was quoted as saying, Tim was always out there doing work, and Dave would always be at the house. It seemed more like Dave was the boss instead of Tim being the one who owned it. Uh, it was the other way around. The living arrangements took a strange role reversal. Freeman's diaries revealed that while he and his family lived comfortably upstairs, Tim Good became a virtual prisoner in his own basement. Trooper J.B. Armstrong was quoted as saying, The diaries were very detailed. He indicated what kind of chores Tim Good was to do that day. He even indicated what time he was to eat that day, if he was even allowed to eat. Every aspect of Tim Good's life was dictated by Dave Freeman. And then it shows this reenactment of Dave Freeman going into Tim Good's basement jail cell room, basically. Tim Good's just sitting on the bed reading. And Dave Freeman busts in and he's all like, Is that what I told you to do? Is there anything else I told you to do? And Tim's like, you, you, you told me to clean the basement. And he goes, I told you to clean the basement. Now, when did I tell you to do it? And he's like, uh, yesterday. And he goes, yesterday. That's right. Get up here. Get up. And then he like shoves him into the wall like he's about to like butt rape him. And I'm not yeah, even joking. Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. I was thinking this, of that. I was like, oh my this God. This turns like very, get raped. Like this turns, this scene is very homoerotic, I must say. Um, and then, like, Tim's just cowering as he's got him, like, pressed up against the wall, like, like uh, he's cowering like a little dog or something. A prison bitch. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I just gotta say it right here. Tim Good comes across as such a pussy. Like, where's, yeah. where's your manhood, dude? Where, where's your, we're not gonna take it. No, we ain't gonna take it. Where's that attitude at? This is America. We're not gonna take it. 
Animal. You know, this is America. We don't just we don't just imprison people and subjugate them. Stand up for yourself, man. Get some balls. Fight back. Live free. Let liberty reign supreme. Like I said, he was a little bit too good. And I got a got a little bit too uh, to the too point, excited to the about point, that. I think he was too good. And what do I, what do I mean by that? No. He he saw too much good in people to the point where he overlooked some obvious problems. Well, I'll get to I'll get to my analysis right of what I think face. about this guy after uh, at, at the end here. Um, but of course, Tim Good I mean, didn't just think about it. I mean, just I, I can't even believe how a, a man or anyone would let some random guy who's an employee of yours. Come into your house little and stay there, let alone. You barely even know them. And then take over your life. Take over your your residence. Take over your business. Lock your ass in a basement jail, essentially, and dictate every aspect of your life. How does that happen? Like you said, I mean, you have to be... I mean, you know, may the guy rest in peace, but... It, that is a very pussy thing to do. I mean, it, it's just maybe it's not. Maybe there's more to it. Maybe he, Dave Freeman, uh, was abusing him more than you saw in the segment. If that's the case, then I can see why he was like that. But at the same time, it would be like fight back. I'm gonna save my thoughts about something about all that t till the end. Um. Every single day, Tim would do something that would irritate or disgust Dave Freeman. Basically, Tim couldn't do anything right. It was either a mistake or it wasn't the way God would want him to do it. Oh, Jesus. To quote Bill Burr, uh, got to bring religion into it. I think I gotta... that's, that's probably part of it, too. That's probably part, also part of why he went along with this is because Dave manipulated his religion. He, he made made him believe that okay this was god's will and and so on yeah religion's a great way to subjugate people and have i mean it's been it's literally been a tool used by kings and pharaohs look, since the beginning the of spanish time inquisition. look at the spanish inquisition i mean what they did uh in the name of god look what's happening right now over in the middle east in the name of their god you know religion it it's you know what can you say i'm not going to go into that but you know, yet again. I would again, say it's organized religion. I wouldn't say it's just religion in itself is what leads to that, but it's organized religion. Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Tim, I don't really like any of it. Uh, Tim's neighbor, <laughs> George Anderson, said, When I first met Tim, he used to come to my house all the time. We would see each other every day. We talked about farming and stuff, but... uh." And then at the end, Tim just started staying away from me. In fact, George Anderson, who becomes kind of a big player in this, did not see Tim Good or Dave Freeman for a year. He assumed they left the area. And then one afternoon in October of 1994, a taxi cab came down the road up to Tim Good's farm. Well, my kids were outside in the front yard and started hollering at me, saying Dave and Eliza were back. So I went up there to talk to Dave about Tim because... I hadn't seen him for a year. I asked him where Tim was at, and he said he hadn't seen Tim for a long time, and he, he walked up to the house, and he said someone had broken into the kitchen door, and he opened the door and looked in, and uh, that's as far as he went. J.B. Armstrong was quoted as saying, I believe Dave Freeman went back to the farm to remove his diaries and was surprised by the neighbors, and he knew he couldn't remove anything without the neighbors observing that. Later that day, George Anderson's son-in-law gave Freeman and his family a ride to Washington, D.C. He dropped them off at a service station along the Beltway. They have not been seen since. Two weeks later, police discovered the decomposed remains of Tim Good. Grocery store receipts indicated that Freeman and his family lived in Tim Good's house for seven months after Good's death. They apparently left when they ran out of money. Good's bank account, which had previously held a million dollars now contain less than two dollars in his diaries tim good was starting to question dave freeman about the money and dave freeman was starting to realize that he didn't quite have the control over timothy good that he once had and that possibly led to his demise 
which was J.B. Armstrong was quoted as saying that at the end there. Why um, did it take that long, though, for him to yeah, stand up for himself? I mean, I would have just left if I could have. I mean, it would have been one of those, all right, when what's-his-name is out doing work, I'm gone. So there's an update. After Unsolved Mysteries... This update is extremely frustrating. After Unsolved Mysteries uh, aired the segment, a viewer called in and provided authorities with the location of the su suspect. That night, deputies staked out a home in Sterling, Virginia. When the suspect drove away the following morning, deputies overtook the car and arrested Dave Freeman. He is being held without bond under the name of William David Cooper. He faces first-degree murder charges in West Virginia for the murder of Tim Good. So there's an, like what I meant by this update is frustrating is because an extremely frustrating is because there's an extra thing to it. Law enforcement tracked him down and made the arrest. He pleaded guilty to manslaughter and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He has since been freed. So you're saying he's a free man? Yes. He he these fuckers I know. these fuckers they had it in their last names. Tim was good. And now Dave is a Freeman. Yep. I mean, all the clues are in the last names, people. And, and, J, and J.B. Armstrong is... is he's, a, he's, he's got a strong fucking arm. If you look okay, at his arm in that segment, you can tell that guy lifts weights. It all makes sense. You gotta look but at I mean, the last really, names. really, seriously, Dave Freeman being a free man after killing somebody and leaving... It, and, and keeping him... Not only killing somebody but he kept this man prisoner in his own home for a long time for months stole all his money and then killed him then fled he just gets a manslaughter charge or something like shouldn't it be murder not manslaughter but well, okay they didn't go into the details of the case but in the courtroom i mean you know they have to prove that they said that he was strangled but they have they have to prove they have to pin that on on uh, dave freeman who who says who says that they did? You know, circumstantial evidence might have been all they had to go on. They never said they had any. Yeah, DNA regardless, evidence. though. I mean, ten years. Oh, I know it sucks, but that's our legal system. You have to prove that he first degree murdered him. I mean, the, it was probably left up to a jury, and they, you know, given all the various options of conviction. Who else could have done that? <laughs> There's I know. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, unfortunately, it look if it looks at you know if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck in our legal system, it's not always a duck, even though it's blatantly obvious to everybody else. And I'm just like throwing out the reasonable doubt uh, vein. Obviously, it's clear to me that he did it, but when you're speaking legally, it's like, well, were there fingerprints on him? Was there is there anything that could necessarily tie him to that? I mean, it seems like they could have charged him with more than just manslaughter. It seems like they could have charged him with, I don't know, like squatting in, on someone's property. Kidnapping. Uh, kidnapping. In, uh, uh, like imprisonment, like false imprisonment. Um, embezzlement. Yeah, embezzlement. Uh, fraud. Uh, yeah. Like, it see, there seemed like there was a myriad of charges they could have given this guy, but didn't. Um, now, my analysis of Timothy Good. I have known a lot of Timothy Goods in my life. I know a lot, and they're usually, I'm not trying to be sexist here, but they're usually female. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of people who don't have enough self-worth and self-esteem to be able to put their foot down with people. And I know a lot of people who say, for instance, are in really shitty relationships with these douchebag guys who might be abusive or controlling. And the woman stays in the relationship for years and years, even though he, the guy beats her and does this, that, and the other. Or maybe verbally, you know, attacks, which is just as bad, if not worse, you know, than physically. Because that can stick with you much longer than the physical wounds do. And I feel like Timothy Good was just another one of these people that... Yeah, he was doing good on uh, to the things that the outside world considers successful. He's got money. He's got this. He's got that. But inside, he was unfulfilled. You know, it, as they say in the segment, they don't say why, but they say he was estranged from his family. Why was he estranged from his family? You know? Yeah. Um, 
so he does he doesn't have family and if you don't have family and you don't have a lot of friends and a very dominating very charismatic person comes into your life and you're at that point of weakness in your life to where you're open for somebody to kind of take control and kind of give you a purpose then a lot of a lot of people will do that they'll jump on that opportunity um it happens to guys too you know i mean it the uh, it hasn't happened to me to this extent, but I mean, I've been in like bands before, or I've been in uh, partnerships, like if, if we're working on something, I've, or going back to the band thing. I was in a band one time with this really controlling uh, bass player, and he was a fucking asshole. And that's crazy. There's a bass player who's I know, the controlling. I know, one. right? You're fucking bass player. <laughs> you don't, you don't write people. any of the music. A bass player. I was the guitar player too, which is usually the the head writer in the band. You know, and and he was the kind of personality to where he was very, but like he was very loud and he was very domineering, and if he didn't get his way, um, it, it was just. A he was a pain in the ass to deal with like he was very opinionated yeah. and he was very assertive and you almost you almost didn't want to cross him because you didn't you i, I didn't want to cross him just because i didn't feel like hearing his bitching and moaning and yelling and screaming which mm -hmm. he would totally it would never went it never got physical but he just had that kind of personality to where it's like i could see how someone could get trapped with this person you yeah. know if, well, I, I agree with you. I, I do feel that a lot of people get in situations like this. There is something that makes them more susceptible to getting into situations such as this. I, I, but with the whole abusive relationship thing, I don't think it's just a case of they're susceptible to it. They're open to it. I think it's also the, their um, income. In a lot of ways, that's another big reason why. Uh, some of these women and maybe even some of these men stay in these abusive relationships is because the the guy is the one that's bringing money into the house. Yeah, you they know, I, I feel have, like sometimes they're, they're I, connected to him in a, in that way. I feel like that's a cop and out, I, though. I feel like I feel like that's. I don't. I don't. I don't think. Really, honestly, I don't think it's the only reason. But I do feel, and some look at some some places, that is one of the main reasons why. Because there's no there's no way for these other women to get a job, or you know their work history is bad, or or and so on. And other instances too is they have kids, and and some some people don't want to break up the relationship because they don't want to do that to their kids. Well, it all plays on it all plays on the the mentality that these these submissive people have. Yes, that's what I meant, but I mean there's also other factors. Well, yeah, well. there there are other factors, but ultimately, at the end of the day, if they had the constitution to pick themselves up and 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 get out there and they had that go get them attitude, they wouldn't stick with that in that relationship for a second longer, even if they had a shitty work history. Even if they, because people with that personality can go out and get a job and and make something for themselves, even if they have no job history. It's they they just have those tools. And those people who get stuck in these kind of situations, they don't have the ability to do that. Uh, they they just don't have it in them. They don't have that character set. And it's not a bad thing or a good thing. Everyone has different character sets, different personality traits. They don't have those personality traits to where I'm going to leave this man. I'm going to go get a job. Damn it! I'm going to get my own place. I'm you know. And we see even in unsolved mysteries, we see cases where women do do that. You yeah. know, and they do that for themselves. And it's it, 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 domestic violence and things like that in abusive relationships. It's it's not black and white. I do not think it's black and white. In this case, it was black so, and white. <laughs> get it, it? It is. Yeah, yeah. Because he was a black guy. Did I over-explain yeah. that joke? <laughs> yeah, I think I did. Uh, yeah, definitely. Oh, well. I, I think you ran it over with a steamroller. Damn it. Um, but anyway, yeah, I don't think it's just black and white. And I, I agree with you, but I do feel that there are other factors that have to be taken into account that also exasperate and uh, end up uh, really making those other sort of aspects of somebody's personality really start to come into play and really uh, start dominating their lives. For me, the, you know, I'm putting myself in Tim Good's situation. For me, okay, I get being depressed. I get that empty feeling. Someone comes in, fulfills it, you know, whatever. I think for but me... The moment the abuse started, I'm gone. 
That's it. I think for me personally, the moment when I'm sitting in a concrete room with yeah. like barely any food, knowing that I own all this shit, and someone's telling me that like, oh, you don't get to eat today, God says, and all that. I think there comes a certain point where you're just sitting there going, wait a second. This is all bullshit. What are you talking about? Get the fuck out of my house. I have steak in my refrigerator. Fuck off, you know, get out of here. Like, I'm calling the cops, you know? Like, there would come a point for me personally to where it's like, you're a charlatan. You're a bum. You're, you're, you're a leech. Maybe he thought that, but he was afraid of what, what Dave would do to him. Yeah, well, I mean, again, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Uh, and, and if, I, I think he was absolutely 100% screwed the moment he allowed him to start controlling him. Yeah. And started to stay in his house. Because I think Dave was the type of guy who was not going to let that go. And obviously was willing to kill him. Yeah, and he did over who you know. Did. Uh, finally, it just got to the point to where yeah, he just you know did Tim something. Actually, was starting to get the clue, get a clue, and realizing that this is bullshit. And then uh, D Dave killed him and strangled him. You know, which is always as as investigators say, it's always a very personal way to kill somebody. Yeah. You know, um, didn't stab it's, him. It's, it's, didn't... It is absolutely one of the most fucked up cases on the show. I mean, you got self, you got imprisonment in your own home in like a basement, which is just absolutely stunning. And then the murder, and then the the asshole gets off free. He's a free man now. He's a freeman. Yep, a Dave Freeman. So yeah, whew, okay, let's relax Doesn't after that. Doesn't get any <laughs> happier, folks. The next case is justice. Well, this one is. Uh, this, this one has a better ending, but it's it's still pretty. Uh, there's a pl there's more of a, there's more of a a playfulness dare I say yes yeah but at the same time there's still this darkness to it that... yes which is what makes it which was it makes it great in my opinion well not you know I don't know if that's the right <laughs> you people watch this show knowing that there's going to be rapes and murders and shit and you still watch it so apparently there's there's a certain part <laughs> of your mind where you're okay with this shit to a certain extent let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> All right, so let's we're going into Eugene Hilliard, uh, Rusty, Rusty, Rusty Shackleford. No, another King of the Hill reference there. Um, yeah, there's actually a small city in Jacksonville called Hilliard, and it's just as redneck as it sounds. You go to Hilliard and you shoot your guns. Anyway, <laughs> for forty thousand Americans, nudity is a way of life. Okay, now I'm sure. Robert Stack was having to look at his, like, the amount that they are paying him for this segment before he read the script. He's like, oh, Jesus. This is the first line of what I have to read for 40,000 Americans. Nudity is a way of life. He's sitting in his dressing room. He's got, like, curlers in his hair and that weird, like, gown that all actors wear in their dressing room. And then he, like, looks over at his check for, like, you know, $20,000 for that week. And he goes, well, for 40,000 Americans, nudity is a way of life. Uh, it's just funny hearing Robert Stack deliver that line. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, this whole segment starts out rather innocent, and they're like, oh, it's just a regular fraud segment. Okay, you know, some guy defrauds some people in a nudist colony. Well, wait, nudist colony? Yeah, so for 40,000 Americans, nudity is a way of life. Sunny Sands Resort in Northeast Florida. Don't! Oh, Northeast Florida, that's exactly where I live. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> Why is it got to be North? <laughs> Not only Florida, but in my backyard. Uh, Sunny Sands Resort in Northeast Florida is one of the 200 nudist clubs in the American Sunbathing Association. Whole lot of things in That's that sentence thing. that just... The American Sunbathing Association. All right. Well, it's American Sunbathing Association. Hey, you know, if I was a funnier person, I'd have like 700 jokes for that, but there it is. Clothes aren't outlawed here, they're just avoided. Many outsiders consider public nudity strange or sexually exploitive, but to the 66 families of Sunny Sands, being nude is only being natural. Jerry Noonan, the co-owner of Sunny Sands Nudist Camp, says, There's a real unfortunate misconception that being in a nudist club means sexual behavior, a lot of drinking, a lot of partying atmosphere, that kind of thing. And here you don't find that kind of atmosphere. You don't find that here at all. You find families. 
you'll find things that that are, are you'll find that things are a lot more wholesome here than say Daytona Beach or downtown Orlando or a lot of other places. Oh, look at this bitch calling out all these cities in Florida talking trash, <laughs> talking smack. It's true though, Daytona gets pretty crazy. What's wrong with downtown Orlando? Got a problem with the mouse? You got a problem with the mouse, you got a problem with me. While most people consider public nudity offbeat, its devotees consider lifestyle without clothes healthier and more open, to say the least. However, from time to time, the clubs attract single men whose only intentions are to exploit the, the environment. So they must carefully screen their applicants. They don't always succeed. They don't always succeed. Succeed? What the fuck? They don't always succeed, as we'll see in this story. <laughs> they, don't always su- they don't always succeed? <laughs> <laughs> they don't always succeed. They don't always succeed from the union, but they do succeed. Uh, no, they... No, I, I mean, like, wow. Guys, no, how the always, fuck... How am I a wedding succeed. DJ? How do I go to... You know how, you know how dirty that sounds? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, bitch, I paid you the $50. <laughs> Now I'm going to pull my pants down and you're going to suck some seed. <laughs> Pour me a uh, glass of milk in a dirty glass. This, this is the moment where the podcast officially went off the rails, folks. Yeah, I don't know why you guys even listen to this. Um, <laughs> I don't know how I have any kind of professional career in like weddings or, or gigs. Uh, With A, uh, how uh, shitty I read, and B how dumb I am and how my inability to pronounce words, uh, simple words that I should have learned a long time ago. Um, So in February 1988, a few months before I was born, a clever con man calling himself Garland Houston Russell, or Rusty for short, arrived at the Sunny Sands Resort and asked to join the camp. Dennis Noonan, the other co-owner of Sunny Sands, said, Rusty was immediately likable. He was not high pressure, He explained to us that he was looking for a place to live, but he understood when we said that he couldn't move in right away. We needed to take more time to get to know him and him to know us. Then his wife, Jerry, says, Being a single guy, we try to be a little careful. And as far as... I think the easiest way to say it is, he was being very friendly. (laughs) But also very careful and very lonely. He was looking for a friend and someone to share his life with. Now, anytime you're in a nudist camp and someone says someone's being very friendly, I, I got to start to scratch my head there. Um, <laughs> oh, he likes you. You can tell. Just keep that thing away from me. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell. Just pop it. Just, just. Yeah, just, I'm very just, friendly. Uh, <laughs> see, see there? Uh, I'm going to point. I'm surprised they didn't do a Beavis and Butthead episode about them trying to get into a nudist camp. Oh, you want to know which direction the uh, showers are? They are that way, right there. Uh, Rusty, why'd you have to do, point I could, that? I could totally see a Beavis and Butthead episode. <laughs> yeah. Trying to, I'm, I'm getting into a new disc colony. There's like <laughs> 900 segments of uh, Beavis and Butthead. There, there's a lot of them out there. I'm sure there's one where there's they're involving nudist uh, things <laughs> of some kind. Uh, Rusty told the camp owners after the sudden death of his parents in a car crash, he claimed their estate was in probate and he'd be wealthy when it was settled. The nudists played themselves in the reenactment, so it shows them, you know, talking yeah, and all most that. Most of the people who are in this segment as themselves are people you don't want to see naked. Yeah, absolutely not. That's usually the case with these nudist colonies. They're people you do not want to see naked at all. And I don't know why, but it seemed like naked 80s bodies and 90s... Well, it seemed like naked 70s, 80s, and 90s bodies just, just look different than naked bodies of now. Like, I don't know why it is. Like, they Yeah, get... probably because they weren't airbrushed and uh, photoshopped and all of that. Ooh, burn on technology there. <laughs> I think also like the tan lines were weirder and sh- I don't know. Yeah. Um, so then someone comes in uh, who's only called Vicky and it's in air. Well, it's not air quotes. It's actually in quotations on the screen. I can just Vicky. <laughs> Vicky. And it doesn't even explain um, who this lady is, what her relation is to any of this. But you kind of figure it out later on. So this lady, Vicky, comes in and says, Everybody seemed to like Rusty. He did everything for everybody. He seemed to love children. Uh. 
again, folks, at a nudist camp, if someone's saying they love children, I gotta scratch my head a little bit. They saw him as a big brother, uh, or big uncle. Uh, Rusty renovated an empty store in Crescent City, 15 miles away, and stocked it with videotapes. He said he'd acquired them in the service. Police now suspect he stocked the entire store with inventory stolen from Texas. Now I just got to ask here, who steals VHS tapes besides Mike? I mean, who the (laughs) fuck besides my co-host here, Mike, would want to steal VHS tapes? Honestly. Uh, um, Back then, VHS tapes were actually really, really highly valuable and uh, profitable. Oh. Um, this is when rental stores actually were pretty big business and, uh, you didn't have Netflix folks. You didn't have Amazon prime streaming. You didn't have torrents. The internet wasn't even around or if it was, it was you weren't able to download stuff on, off of it. Hell nah. You weren't able to download shit. I remember in 1999 trying to download a song off Napster and if it was like three megabytes, it took you three hours. To download that and three megabytes is like nothing now so yeah. yeah this guy opens up this video rental store as a front apparently now i actually like in, in the scene it shows some movie posters in the store did you yeah, recognize any, any of those yeah movies? i did actually there's married to the mob bat 21 uh some movie called war birds which i think is this is clearly something they had random posters up in this place they i guess they must have shot in some rental store uh, because they had Warbirds. It was a film that was released direct to video, and I don't think it came out in 89. Well, it might have. Well, obviously it did since this was... So I think it came out... Yeah, it must have came out in 89. So I love that you... I, I knew that you would know all this, this stuff. That's why... This, I, is this segment <laughs> aired in 89, so it obviously had come out by then. Um, and there's a couple others, but Bat 21 and Married to the Mob, I remember off the top of my head. How, Mike, Mike, for you personally, I'm asking you personally this question, like, how stoked would you be to, like, take a romp through, like, like, say in a time capsule, you could go back to one of these old VH, like, mom and pop VHS stores? That would be awesome. I would be super stoked to do that. Yeah, I, I bet you would. I would be stoked to go in the video game section of one of these old stores, like the Super Nintendo yeah. section, see what kind of like rare, you know, like games that I, I now know are rare, but at the time you didn't know. Yeah. Well, with VHS 2 back in the day, folks, uh, they were expensive. Uh, eighty nine ninety five. <laughs> Some what? of them were 90 bucks just for one. Holy shit. Are you serious? Serious. Yeah. Oh, my God. I did not. I honestly did not know that, that they got that like that up in price. Damn. So I mean that was what it was back then, and that's why some of the that's why the rentals were so big is because uh, a lot of people were outpriced. They were priced out of the market. VCRs were four hundred, five hundred dollars, or something, or more than that, in some instances. And there were there were actual places early on where you could rent VCRs. I remember that. Yes, I remember you could rent VCRs from Blockbuster. At one point, you could do that. They came in these big plastic cases. Yeah, you could rent game systems too. Which just yeah. seemed crazy. But um so anyway, for members of Sunny Sands, Rusty had a special deal. God, that why does everything sound sexual here? That name. Yeah. That sounds like a porn star. <laughs> yeah, I'm Rusty. I got a special deal for or, or Sunny, sunny Sands. Sands. Yeah. And sunny Sands sounds like I got <laughs> some Sunny Sands for you. <laughs> So he sold the tapes to his friends and bought them back at a slightly higher price. A tax dodge, he told them. And then this is from the reenactment. This is how he. Why would you even get? Did, why would I don't understand how this works. Somebody who says tax dodge. I, I somebody clearly says tax dodge in their conversation with you. Well, yep. Oh, I'll sign that. I'll sign up for that tax dodge. And I love how even unsolved mysteries in this segment, do, like, just brushes that detail aside. That everybody in this uh, sunny. Sands community was trying to get over on the government. That that they brush aside and they focus on the yeah. shit. This other I mean, stuff that's up to come. As soon as I heard that, I was like, I'm not signing up for no tax job, tax dodge. Thing. I don't even I don't understand want... how this deal works. All right, this is how I don't he... want the IRS on my ass. This is how he explains it in the segment. Like, let you out there, let me know if you understand how this makes any sense. He goes, All right, here's the deal. You're gonna give me a check for five hundred dollars. I'm going to give you a check for $600. You hold that check for 90 days, and you pick up 20% on your money. You cash that check after 90 days. You get to watch the tapes. You give the tapes back to me. 
And then I'll rip up these tapes as used tapes. And then I'll get over, on, get over on the government, you see. You make the money. I'd rather give it to you than the government. Uh, I don't know uh, how. You, uh, how does that work? Um, I, I don't understand that. Those better be some damn good tapes. You better not be giving me crappy titles. I, I don't I just don't understand how that how he is how that's a getting over on the government how that's like I don't know maybe that's a tax write off or something I don't know yeah yeah and so how did you feel about this guy's acting like overall like I thought he did a great job actually I, he's the, very uh, likable and uh, good performance uh, speaking of porn star kind of thing I totally remember this like when he first drives up to the Sunny Sands Resort and he's in his car and he's speaking to the the uh what is it the megaphone thing or whatever where you the, go up yeah, and intercom system. you talk to somebody the intercom system i swear to god the show played porn music <laughs> it sounded like porn music anyway yeah and i mean this guy definitely do drives like a, do a dodge charger and has a mustache i mean even if he doesn't he does he didn't you know? have a mustache but yeah he, inside you know. his his spirit animal had a mustache <laughs> His soul has a mustache. Yes. Very, His soul has a porn stash. <laughs> like a Burt Reynolds fucking just hardcore, just mustache riding mustache. I mean, this is some this is some stank left over from the 70s over here that we're dealing with. So according to one of the neighbors, everybody was making their returns from their investments at first. So it turned out to be a fruitful deal for the Sunny Sands community at first. After four months, Rusty wanted to expand the store. He approached a neighbor for a $20,000 loan. And this is like 1990s money. So, I mean, this is probably like 30000 Late now. 80s. Late, oh, yeah. late 80s. Okay, so let's say $35,000. Um, so that's a lot of money. Um, the neighbor quickly agreed. That's just how much trust he had instilled in this community, apparently. Just six weeks later, Rusty asked another couple for $20,000 more. He didn't tell the second couple about the first investor. Quoting this couple, he needed money to buy more tapes and equipment, and we wanted to make some interest on our money, so it was just an investment as far as we were concerned and helping the, out the, somebody at the same time. The couple in the reenactment cracked me up with what they were wearing. It's like they were wearing some kind of cowboy outfits or something. It was like this red, bright red outfit. It was just like one of those like, wow. It's kind of hard to take any of these people seriously. Put that on because the morning. because then you flash back to Jerry uh, Noonan or whatever, one of the co-owners, and she's wearing this like sash, like kind of papoose looking thing yeah. around her. Like, you know, she didn't want to wear clothes for that Unsolved Mysteries interview. And she's like, oh, fine, I'll just throw this on. That looks, looks like, like a, a yoga instructor or something. It, it looked like she was <laughs> like a, a like a monk, like but she was like a white lady. So it just didn't look right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Rusty flourished at Sunny Sands, and he was surrounded by happy friends who supported his business. This lonely man seemed to have finally found his place in the sun. Good job, Robert Stack. That was a good read. Um, then, scary music cuts in, and it goes to a scene, an establishing shot of the outside of Rusty's trailer. Now, this music, I wish I could play it for you. This literally, when this music cuts in, it's like... You just knew. You just know that like the dark cloud is formed. You know they set they set it up and set it up and set it up. So far, so good. Scary music cuts in, established on the trailer. Shit's about to get real. So then this naked girl runs out of his trailer. Um, well, she's wearing a towel, but yeah, she's not. Yeah, totally naked. In August <laughs> August twenty eighth, nineteen eighty eight just a few days before yours truly was born, Rusty's careful setup began to unravel when the 11-year-old daughter of his closest friends fled in tears from his trailer. Quote, She said that he threw her against the wall and threw her on his bed and that he was touching her all over. The rest is a little personal and I'm trying... Um, and in trying to do that, she hit him three times before Ugh. getting away from him. And this was Vicky, Ugh. quote unquote. Now we learn... Vicky is most likely the mother of this girl. It never yeah. says who she is, but she's coming in here and talking this, that, and the that's other. What I, that's what I thought. It's got to be anyway. the mother. So state authorities issued a warrant for Rusty's arrest. Sexual battery against a child under the age of 12, uh, a charge for which he'd be held without bond. 
uh, quoting the officer here, we handcuffed him, we put him in the back of the car, and we took him down to operations to be processed and to interview him. He verified the little girl's story, but he put a different slant on it. He said they were nude, and which is not unusual, being in a nudist you know, camp or whatever, and they were in the trailer, but he, and he even admitted to touching her pretty much all over her body, but he said they were having fun and they were wrestling. But that just, that just didn't ring true. It just wasn't Bullshit. right. But he, he held fast to his story that he had no intent to assault her. When Rusty was arrested, nobody believed it. They were all shocked. Now, he was this guy that everybody liked and turned around and said that he did something so despicable. And then they turned against us. And this is Vicky talking here. And they said, oh, no, that child is lying. You know, it's easier to blame the child than it is to say, well, this guy who's so nice isn't as nice as we thought. Which, again, leads me to believe that absolutely Vicky is the mother. Um, so then Jerry, the uh, co-owner of Sunny Sands, said, I would have believed that Rusty would have stolen our entire 50 acres and walked away with it rather than him hurting a little girl. That's just because that's the way he presented himself. Rusty's loyal friends convinced the judge to grant Rusty a release on $25,000 bail. Rusty asked Bob Pocket Pickens, uh, his landlord at the video store, to post his bond. Bob Pickens is quoted as saying, I was surprised when Rusty was arrested and he, was, uh, he convinced me that he was innocent. I suppose that was a case of naivete on my part, end quote. Bob Pickens arranged to have the money available in 24 hours. In those same 24 hours, the Noonans were trying to raise Rusty's bail. As they looked into Rusty's business accounts, they were surprised to learn that he was seriously overdrawn at the bank and lied about owning property. The facade that Rusty had dealt about being an honest businessman was all coming apart. And if he was the bad guy financially, chances are he was a bad guy with the child molestation charges, quoting the husband uh, who co-owned Sonny Sands. We tried to get in touch with the bonding agent and spoke to her uh, about what happened, and she wouldn't tell us who was coming up with the collateral, and by the time we found out, he had been granted bail, quoting Vicky. Quoting Vicky again, I was really shocked that he got out on bail, and he shouldn't have. I was told by the investigator that he had gotten out on bail, but then he, or that he wasn't yeah, going to get how, out on bail. how? Because it said he was arrested, and it was, there was supposed to be no bond, so... Why the hell was he let out on bail? Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, all the the friends of Sonny Sands, before they found out he was a piece of shit, they convinced the judge to let him out on bail. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just so completely... Did. <laughs> but and then, really, it's just hard for me to believe. There's that, a lot of you know, information going on here. Uh, it's hard to believe that anyone would just let that guy out on bail, but apparently that's what happened. Also, Bob, come on, man. Like, Really? Hey, you know, this guy was a con man. Nobody knew, you know. You can't blame these people until after, you know, they find out. Yeah. Although they seem, you know, does they seem like they're rather gullible. Well. You know, naive is definitely right. Well, he even admitted he was naive, so. When you live most of your life not having pockets that you can put things in, you tend to let other things go, too, I think. I mean, you know, these people. Well, Bob wasn't in the nudist colony. Maybe he wanted to be. <laughs> and that was that was my escape out of that conversation. Um, in the next 48 hours, Rusty persuaded Bob Pickens to buy his business. He said his reputation as a businessman had been ruined. Ruined! Bob learned later that he was the third person of whom Rusty had sold his inventory to. Mike being the fourth person. <laughs> Quoting Bob here again, as soon as I found out there were other individuals who basically had gotten taken for a ride, I made every effort to have Rusty apprehended and have the bail removed. Rusty raised more cash by selling his car to two unsuspecting parties. I don't know how you do that. I guess you promise the car and they buy it sight unseen, and then meanwhile you sell it to somebody else. There's no else way as well. you could do some of this stuff in today's day and age. No, there's just no way. People people have sharpened up a, quite a bit since these times. Then he rented another car and disappeared. He never showed up for his court date. Big fucking surprise. Um, when Rusty took off, I felt sick, disappointed, surprised, and somewhat of a fool. This guy took us all for a ride. Going to uh, Bob, old Bob Picky Poo there. Um, 
So then an anonymous um, member of uh, the Sunny Sands community said, no matter what happens, we know we'll never get our money back. But at this point, the money is immaterial. I want Rusty caught for what he did to that child. That child's life will never be the same. Police learned that Garland Russell is not Rusty's real name. It is one of the 42 aliases used by Eugene Hilliard. His swindles total at least half a million dollars, which would now, in our money, probably be close to a million dollars. Now, of course, there's a happier ending to this story. He was captured. U.S. Air Force records eventually matched up Rusty's profile and determined his true name was William Eugene Hilliard and that he had multiple outstanding charges prepared against him prior to his association with the nudist colony. Viewers' tips eventually led to his arrest. William Hilliard was found guilty of rape, fraud, and child molestation and sentenced to life in pri imprisonment. The judge further recommended that due to Hilliard's vicious and deceitful nature that he never be eligible for parole. Damn, I don't even remember writing that, but that's pretty brutal. That's awesome. Yeah. Good for that. Good on them. Justice was kind of served there. What a piece yeah. of shit, man. God. Totally. But you know, I mean, like, there are going to be weirdos at nudist colonies. I'm sorry. I don't care, like, how... If you call me closed-minded if you want, but there are going to be some fucking weirdos that... I mean, just... Just the not living your life with clothes, I mean, you're going to be on an alternate level of thinking, like, already, and then, like, someone wanting to enter that. Like hippies. Yeah, it's kind of that hippie mentality, like, you know, clothes are like body prisons, man, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it it's, doesn't surprise me that some fucking weirdo infiltrated your uh, little environment there. You know, I'm sure some of the people were upstanding citizens, but I don't know, dude, that's just, like... A little too bizarre for me, I think. A, because nobody wants to see my naked body on the face of this earth. So, I mean, that's one yeah, of the aspects. Me neither. No. You know, and, and C, it's just kind of like, I mean, dude, you bend it over to tie your shoe, you cough. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that the human body just does not look flatter, especially as a male doing it, does not look flattering in any sense of the, the word. Hairy asshole? Yeah. They well, I was going to be subtle, but all right, Mike just went out and said it. Um, <laughs> hope you weren't eating cereal or anything then. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, or salad. <laughs> or spaghetti. I don't know. Um, I just realized, like, you turn into... You turn into butthead every now and then with your your uh, commentary. So do you have a problem with that? <laughs> no. Then shut up, <laughs> butthole. <laughs> All right. Well, those are our three compelling stories for this week. Um, I feel like this was a good one. I enjoyed this one. This one was fun. I liked these stories. Um would have been nice if there were some more UFOs in there. Um, like, like, like after Rusty had, um, like, purchased the store and renovated it, like, maybe if he saw a UFO in the sky, maybe <laughs> if, if, if that, also at that point some VHS tapes started mysteriously flying off the shelves. That would have really, like, done it for me with this segment. Um, but, you know, you can't have everything you want all the time. No. Um, yeah, I guess that's a podcast there, uh, clocking in a little bit, uh, a little bit longer, I think, uh, a little sorry for the wait there, you know, did what we could, Mike's internet fucked up yesterday, so would have been here earlier, but, you know, what are you gonna do? But I now have, my, I, I now have Mike's phone number, he gave it to me, cause I was like, well dude, you could have texted me, cause I haven't had his number up until now, now I have his phone number. And whenever I wake up in the middle of the night with a bad dream, he's going to do a review of a movie for me uh, like he does on his YouTube channel to lull me back to sleep. So <laughs> that'll be fun. Uh, Mike says he yeah. won't do it, but I, I think with Mike, uh, no really means yes. So No, it means no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're saying no means no with you? My, yeah, you. When it comes to that, no. Why don't you just play one of my reviews on YouTube, and that'll do the trick. All right. I don't, I, I don't have the phone minutes to do that anyway. Fine. <laughs> um, but okay. uh, yeah, we I hope you guys enjoy the podcast. And it was a bit longer, um, but uh, I, we had a, a little bit more fun this time around. There's a healthy uh, amount of chit chat in here too, which uh, I know all of you enjoy so very much. 
Yeah, but uh, it was actually related to the show. So yeah. True. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, I guess we'll see you later. All right, everybody, have a good night. I'm trying to think if I plugged everything. Did I plug everything? I think I plugged everything. Yes, I did. Bye. <laughs> this one's a bit awkward.